everyone, this is Adip. Welcome to my channel Movement Science where I simplify biomechanics with Joe. In today's video, we are going to talk about abnormal gait. We will be discussing 13 different gaits and their specific features which will allow you to identify these gaits properly. So I believe with these 13 gaits, we will pretty much cover all types of gaits and their features. But it is very important to realize that these gaits are not specifically attached to specific conditions but it is more of a manifestation. So what I mean by that is if a person has specific structural or functional problem, this problem will be addressed by your body by finding a way to overcome this and this will manifest in the form of different gates. So what we are going to learn today are specific gates and their features and they may or may not be directly related to a specific condition but it is still important for us to know these specific gates and their features. Okay, so without any further ado, let's get started. So first starting with an overview, we will be talking about antalgic gait, which is a painful gait, Trendlinburg gait, which is caused due to hip abductor weakness, waddling gait, which can also be caused due to hip abductor weakness then going to the other side we have high steppage gait which can happen in cases where there is a foot drop stamping gait which is usually caused due to loss of proprioception and then extensor lurch gait where your glutes are not doing their job and then after this we will go on to some of the neurological gaits so under the neurological types of gaits we have the parkinson's gait the propulsive and festinating which are some of the features of Parkinson's when it is in the advanced stage, choreoform gait where you see irregular and involuntary movements. Then we will go to hemiplegic gait which is one of the most common, you see the circumduction there. And then ataxic or drunken gait where cerebellum is affected, spastic gait where you see scissoring and then hand to knee gait which is usually seen in polio. So now that we know what gaits we are going to cover. Let's quickly go over these gates and see what features each one of them has. So first starting with the antalgic gate, here you see reduced time spent on the affected leg that is your stance phase and shortened step length on the opposite side. So if you can see in the video that has popped up, the time that I'm spending on the foot is very little and it's a shorter step, right? So this tells you that the leg which is in stance phase is the painful leg and the person does not want to put a lot of weight on it because it is painful. So it's a simple antalgic that means painful gait and you see a classic limp in this gait. Up next we have the Trendlinburg gait and what happens over here is the pelvis drops on the opposite side of the weak hip abductor and the trunk shifts towards the affected side to compensate and this is caused usually by glute medius weakness. So if you can see in the video and I will also explain on Joe, if his right hip abductor is weak, when he's putting the right leg forward, the hip abductor muscle won't be strong enough to hold his pelvis in the same line. So what will happen? His pelvis will just drop that way. And because of this, the whole center of mass will kind of shift there. And to compensate there, he'll have to bend his trunk to the other side. So there is that pelvic drop, if you can see in the video, as I put the affected side forward and the hip abductor muscles which maintain the pelvis in the same line cannot hold it. So there is a drop of the pelvis on the other side and a compensation with the trunk. So next if we see that we have the waddling gait where there is side to side sway of the trunk resembling a penguin and the cause is usually the bilateral weakness of hip abductor. So basically it's very similar to the Trendlinburg gait where you see hip abductor weakness just on one side. It's just a bilateral presentation of this. And if you can see the video over here, you can clearly see the side to side trunk sway because of the inability of the hip abductor to stabilize the pelvis. Next we go to high steppage gait. Here we see exaggerated hip and knee flexion to lift the foot up. And this usually happens because the person has a foot drop from peripheral nerve injury. But there can be other reasons for this foot drop as well. For example, if it's a central nervous system problem as well, right? 
where your cerebrum is not sending signal but in this case we have spoken about the peripheral nerve injury so in this what will happen is if you can see in the video because i'm not able to clear the foot off the ground yeah because the leg length is longer now because i'm not able to create that dorsiflexion what i will do is i'll create hip and knee flexion to clear the foot off the ground and that is the high stepage gait which is seen in a case of foot drop which could be caused by peripheral nerve injury or it can be caused by something in the cerebrum where the signals are not being sent or something can be wrong structurally as well after this we are going to stamping gait here we see heavy exaggerated foot contact during walking and this is caused by loss of proprioception in conditions like tibis dorsalis so basically when there is loss of proprioception the person almost feels like he's walking on cotton he's not getting enough sensation and just to compensate for those lack of sensation they will really hit their foot hard on the ground so that they are getting that sensation and feeling that pressure when they are putting the foot on the floor and that's why you see this compensation and it is called as the stamping gait where they hit the floor really hard when they are walking next is the extensor lurch gait here what happens is there is backward trunk lean during heel strike this usually happens because your back extensors compensate for the weak hip extension and this is usually caused by gluteus maximus weakness or inferior gluteal nerve injury so if you can see over here i have a backward lean as i'm walking because my glutes does not do the job of hip extension because i cannot create that hip extension my lumbar extensors are trying to compensate and get that movement and that's what we see in extensor lurch gait where your glute maximus is not doing the job could be because of the nerve injury so now let's go on to the gaits which have specific neurological features so first starting with parkinsonian gait here there are small shuffling steps with reduced arm swing stooped posture and freezing during the movement initiation it is usually caused by parkinson's disease so if you can see the picture over here i have a stooped posture fill rolling tremor which is also seen in parkinson's and then small and shuffling steps if you see all these features you can suspect a parkinson's disease now under the same parkinson's disease we also have some specific features like propulsive gait which is basically a forward leaning posture with difficulty in stopping so the person finds it difficult to start initiate the gait but once they have initiated it they just keep going forward and then there is difficulty in stopping so this is caused by neurological conditions like parkinson's disease and then there is also fascinating gait which is progressively shorter and faster steps usually seen in individuals who have advanced parkinson's disease what happens in these individuals is when they start walking because they have that forward lean their center their center of gravity is already forward and now they are just basically trying to catch their center of gravity because of that forward lean and they are always trying to catch up so that's a very classical fascinating gait next going on to chorioform gait it is a irregular involuntary movements of the limbs and trunk this was a very hard gait to mimic so i would suggest you can just check out some youtube videos for this one um it is caused by the disorders in the basal ganglia such as huntington's disease next we are talking about hemiplegic gait which is one of the most commonly seen gait in stroke or um and lesions here you will see a stiff leg with circumduction that is basically outward swinging of the leg and reduced arm swing on the same side if you can see the picture because there is impairment on one side you can see that the your hand can go in a specific synergy position and the leg can do the circumduction movement as you walk forward because it's probably lacking the hip flexion or it could be because they are not able to clear the ground because the dorsiflexion is lacking so there can be different reasons why they are doing that circumduction but it is usually seen in hemiplegic gait up next we have the ataxic gait or drunken gait which is an unsteady gait with wide base of support during walking you see irregular uncoordinated steps 
caused by cerebellar dysfunction. So this drunken gait is a very common gait seen in cerebellar disorders because the function of cerebellum is balance and when your balance is affected, center of mass is all over the place and they have uncoordinated movements as well as steps. Next we have the spastic gait which is basically stiff seizuring gait with legs crossing the midline. This is caused by spasticity from conditions like cerebral palsy. And then finally we have the hand to knee gait which is seen in polio which is not very common nowadays. But what happens over here is because your quadriceps is not able to do the knee extension, the person uses his hand to push the thighs or the knees to extend the leg. And this is usually caused by quadriceps weakness from the nerve injury seen in polio. So if you can see the video, if I'm not able to extend my knee, what I will do is I'll keep my hand right above the knee and push the knee backwards so that extension is created in that leg. And I'm basically taking over the function of quadriceps by doing it manually. So as you see the function of quadriceps extension which was lacking, I chose to do it by using my hand. I could have done it in other ways, maybe using some external device that was possible. But this is the gait that is seen in polio, so it's a type of manifestation. So now that we have covered all the types of gaits, let's quickly summarize. So first we went over antalgic gait, which is just a painful gait and you try to avoid putting weight on that leg. Then there was Strendlenburg and Wardling gait, which, was, which were very similar. They both have hip abductor weakness in common. In Trendlenburg, you have the hip abductor only on the right side, whereas in Waddling, you have it on the both the sides. Next, we had the high steppage gait, which was basically exaggerated hip and knee flexion to compensate for lack of dorsiflexion at the foot and stamping gait to compensate for lack of proprioception at the foot. Finally, we had extensor lurch gait where the glutes were not doing its job, so the hip extension was compensated by your lumbar extension. So if you notice, pretty much all of them are just compensating for something else in the body, right? Then we had the Parkinson's gait, which had specific manifestations like small shuffling steps, reduced arm swing, stoop posture, and then the advanced stages of Parkinson's had specific features like propulsive gait and fascinating gait. Then we had the choreoform gait, which is irregular involuntary movements seen in Huntington's disease, and then hemiplegic gait, which had circumduction and reduced arm swing due to specific UMN lesions. Then we went over to ataxic gait, which is drunken gait because the cerebellum, which helps us in coordination and balance, is affected. And then spastic gait, which is seen in cases like cerebral palsy, which causes stiff scissoring gait. And then we finally finished with hand to knee gait, which is seen in polio, where you use your hands to push and extend your leg to compensate for the quadriceps weakness. So with that, we finish up this topic. That's all for today guys. Thank you for watching.